Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life. Uh, we thank you for the light that you're opening up at this time in this crisis of Earth's history. We ask that the prophetic message that we are dealing with would better edify us for the coming crisis and uh, better prepare us to give a warning message to those that we come in contact with. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit now. I ask that you pour the latter rain out upon us the way that you're pouring the physical rain out here at this time. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Over here, it's just a kind of a summary of some of the things I've been trying to do. Daniel 11, 11, Rafi and Paneum opened up December 2016. And I'm trying to identify the, the specific passages of Scripture that are directly connected to this message. It is the message of the midnight cry. Uh, we've, dealt, we've mentioned a little bit about Gideon, that when Gideon goes down in the enemy's camp, he is typifying us who on January 11th uh, recognized that Daniel 2 and Daniel 4 were points of reference to understand Rafi and Paneum, understand Daniel's last vision, um, that Daniel 2 is about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy and therefore the four players in Daniel 11, 40 to 45 are four kingdoms the kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000. But also in Daniel 2, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, are the head of gold. So it's also about the kings. So in this last vision, we see struggles between prophetic personalities, um, whether it's Putin and Trump in the line of the king of the south, or the black pope, the white pope in the line of Fatima, um, the kings are part of the story there. And also in Daniel 4, we see the 2520, uh, speaking to the chronology that is part of the Midnight Cry message. Uh, but in order to establish Daniel 11, verse 10 and onward, uh, the Lord takes us to Isaiah 8, Isaiah 7, where we understand what the neck is. The king of the north that defeats the king of the south comes up to the neck. That's giving us the key of understanding to see that Russia was still the king of the south. But it also connects us with the 65 year of prophecy of Isaiah 7, 8, which is once again the 2520. So we've got two witnesses there that the 2520 is part of the midnight cry message. But in Isaiah 6, we have Isaiah in the sanctuary, um, seeing the glory of the Lord connecting with Ezekiel 1.1 and Ezekiel's vision of the sanctuary and Sister White's references to Isaiah in the visions of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and John, who are all in the sanctuary, um, showing us that in Ezekiel 1.1, uh, this experience that the prophets represented in their life is referencing the 30th year of the end of the world, all the prophets are speaking more about the end than the days in which they live. The 30th year is the 30th year of this reform movement. This reform movement began at midnight on November 9th, 1989, and it was 30 years old at midnight, November 9th, 2019. And Ezekiel 1.1 uh, references um, the 45th president of the United States with the four and the five in there. It references midnight. And it references, um, what am I forgetting, uh, the 30th year. And in Isaiah, um, the story of Isaiah with uh, the understanding of Shiloh, I'll put Shiloh up here. We get a connection with Methuselah. And Methuselah, the genealogy of Genesis 5 of Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah have been plugged into this end of the world prophecy and Lamech becomes the symbol of a history of 777. It's 777 days from November 9th, the 30th year, to um, December 25th, 2021. Um, that history is the history of the 45th president. So where, where I was going to next, which we started in in um, Matthew 16 yesterday, 
was uh, I'm making the argument, let's start with that, that Matthew 16 is the second witness to Palmoni. So let's go to Daniel 8.13 to start. Most of us in this movement are familiar and comfortable with um, assigning the attribute of the wonderful number to Christ, and we get it from verse 13 of Daniel 8. And let's just remind ourselves of a couple things. In verse 13 of Daniel 8, it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint. The Hebrew that's translated there as that certain saint is Palmoni. Um, and you need to get into the Hebrew breakdown of it. What's up? The um, part of Palmoni is a familiar word to us in the book of Daniel, which is what? No, part of the word Palmoni, not the whole word, is a familiar word to us. What's the Moni? Many, many tekel yufarsan. Okay, um, so the, the, the connection of the name Palmoni connects with the phrase many, many tekel yufarsan, which was what? Which is what? 2520 right there, just with the name, he's a wonderful number. If you're going to get into the, the Hebrew root of that word Palmoni that's translated as a, that certain saint, but the question is asked there, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? The question is asked about two entities, the daily sacrifice and also about the transgression of desolations. There's two entities that are asked about. And then it's going to tell what those two entities are going to do. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So these two entities, the daily and the transgression of desolation, are going to tread underfoot the sanctuary and the host. This is the question that leads to verse 14. And verse 14, according to Sister White, is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. But verse 14 is the answer. And you can't have an answer without a question. So you can't separate verse 13 from the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. So verse 13 is also the foundation and central pillar of of Adventism, of this movement, and we know, we're not going to do a study on this, we know that Gabriel is given the job assignment now in the following verses of explaining this vision to Daniel, and when he does so, uh, we understand the answer as Adventists in verse 14, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, that that's October 22nd, 1844, but Gabriel is given the job assignment to make Daniel understand these things, and what he does, he gives him a second witness to October 22nd, 1844, as the chapter proceeds, and he introduces the 2520. Um, the 2520 that ends um, on October 22nd, 1844, gives Daniel a second witness to October 22nd, 1844. So what I want you to see is that Daniel 8.13 is about the 2300, but it's also about the 2520. So, and it's about Palmoni. So when I'm suggesting that the emphasis that we place on Palmoni, the wonderful number, um, in terms of identifying that as a symbol, that Matthew 16 is the second witness for this. If this is so, if we have a second witness for him being the wonderful number, one of the things that we have is we have another witness to the midnight cry message being the 2520. This would connect. Daniel 8.13 is about the 2520. And we already have Daniel 4 connected with Rafi and Paneum. And we have Isaiah 7 verse 8 connected with Rafi and Paneum telling us that the 2520 is part of the midnight cry message. And here we have the 2520 is the, the second witness to the 2300 days, so it's, it's connecting that way. Um, so with that in mind, we read through Matthew 16 yesterday. I want to go to our notes from yesterday um, on page 3.
And I want to argue because, of the, because I believe the wonderful number is the wonderful number that this chapter in Desire of Ages is purposeful. It's chapter 45. Um, and that would be the history of 777, the history of Lamech, the history of the last president of the United States, the history that we're living in right now. And I want to argue that the next chapter, chapter 46, um, is the Sunday Law, if you want to put it at th that way, or the first Sunday Law would be July 18th, 2020. Um, and I'm saying that because the Sunday Law was typified by October 22nd, 1844. That's where the door closed in the Millerite movement, and the door closes at the end of Adventism at the Sunday Law. Therefore, on October 22nd, 1844, we had the conclusion of what? 46 years, from 1798 to 1844. So 46 is a symbol of the, the construction of the temple, the development of the temple, the sanctuary and the host. It's about the, these two entities, the sanctuary and the host. So I'm saying that chapter 45 is speaking to the history of the 777, and chapter 46, it's not an accident um, that chapter 46 um, follows chapter 45. It would do it numerically, but I'm saying that it's purposeful that 46 is also speaking to the temple of our history. And what happens in chapter 46 is Sister White comments on the transfiguration okay, of Christ. Um, and who appears with him at that point? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Um, representing those that are going to be saved at the second coming, those that have to die, as Moses did, and those that do not die, as Elijah represents, the 144,000. And of course, Christ. And uh, how many disciples did Christ take with him to the Mount of Trans Transfiguration? Did he take 12? Three. Three. So when they went up the mountain, what was it? 3-1 Three, one. Three, one combination. Um, so I'm saying that all of this is present true. So let's read through quickly the chapter 45. These aren't long chapters. And if you remember Stephen's presentations, when he's dealing with the history of 777, he reaches a point where he marks the cross as the Sunday Law, and he takes this chapter title, The Foreshadowing of the Cross. Um, the foreshadowing is a history that leads to the cross, and he makes it the history of 777. And I'm saying I agree with him, but it's also the history of the 45th President of the United States. I do not believe that this chapter title is an accident or a coincidence. This is purposeful, okay? This is what leads to the Sunday Law, the cross of our history. And Sister White tells us that what leads to the Sunday Law in the United States, among other things, is that the people of the United States are going to cry out to their political leaders to pass a Sunday Law in order to return to what? Temporal prosperity. temporal prosperity. What's happening to our temporal prosperity over the last two weeks, three weeks? It's being removed at a point in time three weeks ago. Everyone thought the economy was going to go to the moon. It was, it was just perfect. And in two or three weeks' time, we're just on the verge. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I made a, a covenant with the brethren in Africa that we would allow Odilio and Stephen, not allow, but we would allow Odilio and Stephen to go to the other three countries on the promise that by listening to the presentation of Odilio and Stephen, they would be coming to grips with the chronology message. But the promise was that that would mean that they would commit to making sure that they're watching the presentations that are coming out of Future for America from here on out because I was going to deal with Daniel 11. And that's what I'm dealing with. And I want you to know here, in the United States, in the glorious land, it has never been like this before in my lifetime, and I'm an old guy. It's never been like this in American history. Okay? We, in this little town by us, we have... 
correct me if I'm wrong, we have how many Walmarts? Two? Oh, you mean like Hot Springs? Yeah. Yeah, two Walmarts and Sam's Club. Two Walmarts, a Sam's Club, three Kroger's, and then some various small grocery stores. Oh, there's another Walmart, a a newer one, a a little one, neighborhood. Okay, so we have... We have so many grocery stores within 20 minutes of us that it's incredible, but the shelves are empty and you've never seen it before. It's like uh, the Soviet Union uh, during the, the time the Soviet Union was in place, okay? Never happened in the glorious land like that before. Okay, one thing that happened yesterday, uh, one of the states in the United States that let out in gambling has always been the gambling capital of the United States is Nevada. And I don't know what percentage of the the working population of Nevada is connected with the casinos of Nevada, but it's it's a high percentage. Almost everyone in Nevada is connected with that industry and they closed all the casinos and all the restaurants in Nevada yesterday. Okay, so When Sister White says the people of the United States are going to force their legislators to pass a Sunday law in order to return to temporal prosperity, part of the shadow that leads to the Sunday law is a loss of temporal prosperity. And here in the glorious land, you can see it. Um, I don't have the exact statistics, but the millionaires and billionaires in the United States that have their millions and billions in Wall Street, in the past two weeks, they've probably lost 30% of their wealth. Is is that about right? I think I've heard that. I mean, for those guys that lose 30% of their wealth is more than I'd ever make in my lifetime. The economy's in a free fall right now. Uh, So, that's for my brethren in Africa. What we have been saying is coming to pass. And in 2017, in 2017, at the very beginning of 2017, the Lord had just removed His hand from the foundational truth. And when did the Lord remove His hand from the foundational truth of this movement? December 17th, 2016. 2016. So when we're saying at the beginning of 2017, the Lord opened up the subject of Paneum, and He did, within just a couple months after He removed His hand from the truth that the King of the South wasn't the Soviet Union, it was Russia, He opened up Paneum, and at that point in time, some of the predictions that we could see, we did, I didn't know what they meant, and I, I was one of them, that went out in the public arena, I didn't know what it meant, is that when you get to Paneum, you're going to see a pandemic. And you're going to see panic. And Pandora's box is going to be opened. Okay, so those predictions are coming to pass. And they're right, they, they fit right in to the prophetic sequence of events. Even though I will admit we didn't understand, we, we put it in the public record, but we didn't believe it enough to, to do much with it. But let's read this chapter about Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, which among other things I'm claiming is the second witness to Palmoni in Daniel 8.13. The work of Christ on earth was hastening to a close. Before him a vivid outline lay the scenes whither his feet were tending. And I have that bold face because I'm saying that this is a history that you put on a line. The work is closing, and I'm saying that we were taken to Caesarea Philippi when? In 2017, at the very beginning of 2017. Okay? It was in that trimester that began there. And the trimester was still going on, so I'm tempted to say it was like January, February 2017, we were taken to Caesarea Philippi and given an outline that leads to the cross, that leads to the Sunday Law. You follow my logic? If you believe that the Bible and spirit of prophecy are present truth speaking to this day and age. Even before he took humanity humanity upon him, 
He saw the whole length of the path he must travel in order to save that which was lost. Every pain that rent his heart, every insult that was heaped upon his head, every privation that he was called to endure was open to his view before he laid aside his crown and ro royal robe and stepped down from the throne to clothe his divinity with humanity. Just to remind you, I'm saying, and, and I was looking at information this morning, <clears throat> gathering some brief information, rather than going back and trying to recreate my notes from 2017, I just got on the internet, okay? And, and I came across one video clip, there were several, of some Christian uh, that had made a trip to, the, to Pan, to Paneum, to the Temple of Pan, and it's a, it's a historical site. He's just walking on the path, and the Jews have the, the markers. He was putting his camera on and reading what it says, and it's, it, anything I tell you about the Temple of Pan today is right there at that location in Israel. You can go see it. Um, and it points, it, he pointed out, not to the level that we do, that this, this spring that is in that satanic temple is the spring that feeds the Jordan River, and the Jordan River dumps into the Dead Sea. And I want, want you to see that this was just expressed by Sister White. Every priva privation that he was called to endure was open to his view before he laid aside his crown, there he is in heaven, and royal robe, stepped down from the throne to clothe his divinity with humanity. He leaves heaven, and the Temple of Pan is in Mount Hermon, okay? And Mount Hermon is famous for its beauty. It's, there's a couple peaks there covered with snow. And that spring at the Temple of Pan feeds the Jordan River. The Jordan River means, Jordan means descender, and it descends all the way to the Dead Sea. That's what Christ did. This is the story about Christ leaving heaven and coming down and dying. And the truth of that water is the truth that you and I have to be baptized into as he was baptized in the Jordan River if we are going to have eternal life. Okay, so there is so much symbolism in Caesarea Philippi that if you don't see it, then you won't get the significance that this chapter, Matthew 16, is the second witness for Palmoni, which is Daniel 8.13, which is the central pillar and foundation of Adventism, and you have to get it. You have to see this. The path from the manger to Calvary was all before his eyes. He knew the anguish that would come upon him. He knew it all, and yet he said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 47 and 8. Even before he saw the result of his mission, his earthly life, so full of toil and self-sacrifice, was cheered by the prospect that he would not have all this travail for naught. By giving his life for the life of men, he would win back the world to its loyalty to God. Although the baptism of blood must first be received, although the sins of the world were to weigh upon his innocent soul, although the shadow of an unspeakable woe was upon him, yet for the joy that was set before him, he chose to endure the cross and despised the shame. From the chosen companions of his ministries, the scenes that lay before him were as yet hidden. Okay, there was a hiding here. But the time was near when they must behold his agony. What's his agony? The cross. Okay, so there's a, hide, a hiding time, and then the truth of the cross is going to be opened up. They must see him whom they had loved and trusted, delivered into the hands of his enemies, and hung upon the cross of Calvary. Soon he must leave them to face the world without the comfort of his visible presence. He knew how Bitter hate and unbelief would persecute them, and he desired to prepare them for their trials. Jesus and his disciples had now come into one of the towns about Caesarea Philippi. They were beyond the limits of Galilee. Galilee means turning point. In a region where idolatry, idolatry prevailed. Here the disciples were withdrawn from the controlling influence of Judaism and brought 
into closer contact with the heathen worship. Around them were represented forms of superstition that existed in all parts of the world. Jesus desired that a view of these things might lead them to feel their responsibility to the heathen. During his stay in this region, he endeavored to withdraw from teaching the people and devote himself more fully to his disciples. So when you get to Caesarea Philippi, there's a message, an internal message for God's people about the coming cross, the Sunday law. He was about to tell them of the suffering that awaited him, but first he went away alone and prayed that their hearts might be prepared to receive his words. Upon joining them, he did not at once communicate that which he desired to impart. Before doing this, he gave them an opportunity of confessing their faith in him that they might be strengthened for the coming trial. He asked, Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? Sadly, the disciples were forced to acknowledge that Israel had failed to recognize their Messiah. Explain that for me. But at a simple level, I'll explain it. <coughs> this is about 9-11. Yeah. It's about people that did, do not recognize 9-11. Okay? Some indeed, when they saw his miracles, had declared him to be the son of David. The multitudes that had been fed at Bethsaida had desired to proclaim him king of Israel. Many were ready to accept him as a prophet, but they did not believe him to be the Messiah. Okay, there's a distinction between a prophet and the Messiah in their minds. Okay. And Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, remember. Uh, but he's not the anointed one until 9-11, until his baptism. And one of the things I, I won't spend time with, but I want, you to, I want you to understand, check it out. This confession of Peter in this passage in Matthew 16 that she's commenting on here, this is called the Christian Confession. Type in Christian Confession. Google it. You're going to see that this is a giant discussion in Christianity for hundreds of years. This is the, the very summation of what it means to be a Christian. This Christian Confession. And it's twofold. You have to confess that He's the Son of God and that He was the Anointed One. He was the Christ, the Messiah. Um, so if you're going to if you're going to discuss what it takes to be a Christian or to be saved as a Christian and you want to get into the, the theology of Christianity for hundreds of years, this is the point in the Bible that that controversy, because there's a controversy over it and that discussion takes place. So I'm saying that Matthew 16 is an important passage in scriptures, if only for that. Okay, this is a... Daniel 8 is an important passage of Scripture because of the 2300-year prophecy. There's certain passages in Scripture that are primary passages, okay? Matthew 16 is one of them. That's what I'm wanting you to see here. From the first, Peter had believed Jesus to be the Messiah. Many others who had been convicted by the preaching of John the Baptist had accepted Christ, began to doubt as to John's mission when he was imprisoned and put to death, and they now doubted that Jesus was the Messiah for whom they had so long, looked so long. Okay, so there were many people that had accepted 9-11 and they had accepted John the Baptist. They had accepted the message that led to 9-11. They had accepted, accepted the concept of the messenger that came in advance of 9-11. But at the death of John the Baptist, they began to question the role of John the Baptist. And when they did that, then their confidence in 9-11 was swept away also. So they polluted that. They've just taken that and just... The way they may have polluted it, but it's just what happened. I know, but they've switched it to the opposite way. Like the disciples of John were the ones that had the doubt when the reality... No, no, she doesn't, she, she's, not, she's not limiting this to the disciples of John. The disciples in general. Many others who had been convicted by the preaching of John. That's, that, that's a generic statement. That's not just the disciples of John. 
That's his whole movement. Oh. All this whole movement yeah. was willing to say, yes, Brother Jeff was the messenger that was raised up. But if you can cause the movement to doubt the messenger that's raised up, then you can cause the movement to reject 9-11. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're, they're directly connected. Nothing new under the sun. Many of the disciples who had, been, who had ardently expected Jesus to take his place on David's throne left him when they perceived that he had no such intention. John 6. John 6, 6, 6. <laughs> Is, she's referring to John 6 here, and in John 6, 6, 6, they turned and walked no more with him forever. He lost most of his disciples at that point in time. Why? Because of prophetic misapplication. He says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they said, we're not cannibals. They would take his word literally and refuse to imply, uh, apply them spiritually. Okay, they're going to say, the history of the Old Testament has to be literal history for that time and place, and it doesn't speak to the end of the world, world spiritually. Okay? And they turn and walk no more with him forever. But Peter and his companions turn not from their allegiance. The vacillating course of those who praised yesterday and condemned today did not destroy the faith of the true follower of the Savior. Peter declared, Thou art the Christ, this is the Christian confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He waited not for kingly honors to crown his Lord, but accepted him in his humiliation. Peter had expressed the faith of the twelve, yet the disciples were still far from understanding Christ's mission. The opposition and misrepresentation of the priests and rulers, while it could not turn them away from Christ, still caused them great perplexity. They did not see their way clearly. The influence of their early training the teaching of the rabbis, the power of tradition, still intercepted their view of truth. From time to time, precious rays of light from Jesus shone upon them, yet often they were like men groping among shadows. But on this day, before they were brought face to face with the great trial of their faith, the Holy Spirit rested upon them in power. For a little time their eyes were turned away from the things which are seen to behold the things which are not seen. Beneath the guise of humanity, they discerned the glory of the Son of God. Jesus answered Peter, saying, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He just changed his name. He just ex went into a covenant relationship with Peter. And we spoke about what Barjona means yesterday. Yes. What he said there, for flesh and blood have not revealed it. So it almost sounds like Jesus himself didn't reveal it, but God the Father revealed it. Do you think that's what he's saying? Because he became flesh and blood and dwelt among man. The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. The Holy Spirit. His yeah. Father did. The Holy, Sp well, <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit revealed it to Peter. The Holy Spirit revealed it. Yes. yes. So that's the latter rain. Yes. That's the latter rain. That's what... That's Jesus. Jesus and Peter are having a dialogue, and he, he, Jesus is saying, "My Father revealed this to you." And how does the Father reveal something through it to us? Through His Word, through His Spirit. Jesus is right there. Peter was following the influence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Why can you prove that from the context of Matthew 16 at a very simple level without getting into the the deep theology? What's Peter going to do? Peter's going to be both a, Pharise, a, a Sadducee and a Pharisee, not a Sadducee, a publican and a Pharisee in this story, right? He's going to be a wise and a foolish. Here he's wise, and there's a spirit that influences him, and in a moment, there's going to be another spirit that influences him to argues against Christ. So it's an influence of either a good spirit or an evil spirit. You follow my logic? The truth which... Peter had confessed is the foundation of the believer's faith. It is that which Christ himself has declared to be eternal life. So what's the foundation of our faith? The truth which Peter confessed. Which the pr truth which Peter confessed. That's a, a correct but yeah. answer, but it's not what I'm after. What's the foundation of our faith? The 
9-11. 9-11 and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the angel that came down out of heaven at 9-11. Because he's the angel that came down on August 11th, 1820. Sister White says it was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ who came down, Christ being the anointed one, that came down at 9-11. He's the scent. He's the scent of God. And what's the scent? The Holy Spirit and Jesus. Uh, okay, but we won't go there. I thought you were going to the pool that is oh, oh, yeah, yeah. the scent. But we won't go there. It is that which Christ himself has declared to be eternal life. But the possession of this knowledge was no ground for self-glorification. Through no wisdom or goodness of his own had it been revealed to Peter. Never can humanity of itself attain to a knowledge of the divine. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? Only the spirit of adoption can reveal to us the deep things of God. Only what? The Spirit, which eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. And the fact that Peter discerned the glory of Christ was an evidence that he had been taught of God. Ah, indeed, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. That whenever it says <clears throat> the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, that would also connect to Daniel 8.13. Why? Because... In Daniel 8.13, it's the number of yeah, secrets. the number of secrets. It's the definition of Pamona, yeah. the number of secrets. Um, no, I wasn't going there, but... I, I don't mind going there. I'm glad you put that in the record. But what did Peter discern when the Holy Spirit was on him, influencing him? The glory of Christ. What's Christ's glory? Character. His character. What is character? Thoughts and feelings combined. So what's opened up to the 144,000 who Peter represents here. He's a symbol of the twelve, but his name is 144,000. Through the Holy Spirit, what is opened up to Peter is his character. And his character is speaking at least in part to his thoughts. And his thoughts, what I'm saying, include his revelation of numbers, if that's the way to say it in chronology. It's part of his character. It's part of who he is. And it's opened up. Peter sees it. Okay. In Psalms 25, 14, she only quotes half of that. She says, the secret of the Lord is with him that fear him. But if you go read that, it says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. So when you get that secret, you're entering into a covenant, and that's what you're being shown, is this covenant. And the covenant's the 25, 20. That's a number. It's the seven. It's the Sabbath. It's, it's all the 126. Things. Yeah, it's all, it's all there. It's a 252. It's a 63. It's the covenant language. Yeah, so his glory includes the numerical revelation. Yes. Yeah. If that's an okay way to say it. Yeah. And Peter is a symbol of that in his name. You see that. And why, why do we care about his name? Well, we care about his name just because we care about his name. But in context of the midnight cry message that we're in, what does Isaiah 18, his sons are for signs and for wonders, and that allows us to nail down Methuselah, which is Shiloh. So we have to, not only, not only the numbers, but the names. That's part of his glory. Okay, Jesus continued, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Sister White's going to go on and say this. He's not building his church on Peter because the gates of hell are going to prevail against Peter within 10 seconds. Okay, but they're really going to prevail against Peter at the cross. She's going to make just the, the simple logic. 
And she's doing that because of Catholicism, saying this passage here, this is another point about the significance of Matthew 16. This is the passage in the Bible that the Catholic Church claims the authority of the popes, saying, looky there, he put Peter as the head of the church, and we're just following in Peter's footsteps. We're the vicar of Christ on earth. This, is, this chapter in the Bible is just dripping with, with Christian significance. It's, it's as important as Daniel 8, and I'm saying it's the second witness to Daniel 8, 13. Um, but Sister White's going to refute that idea. Uh, who's the rock that the church gets built upon? Christ. Christ, but who are we? We're the, we're the living stones in that temple. So there is a, a relationship, a, a connection there. Um, anyway, Jesus continued, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the extra handout here, I, I have, I mean, it's common. I, all I did this morning went and cut and pasted some things off the internet. That's the name of this temple of Pan, is the gates of hell. All right, And that's where he's at. So if you don't know that, you read it, you think the Christ is just speaking about the, the great controversy between Christ and Satan. But if you realize that the Temple of Pan's name was the gates of hell, and he's right there at that place, it's being specific to the Temple of Pan. Okay? The word Peter signifies a stone, a rolling stone. Peter was not the rock upon which the church was founded. The gates of hell did prevail against him when he denied his Lord with cursing and swearing. The church was built upon one against whom the gates of hell could not prevail. Century before the Savior's advent, Moses pointed to the rock of Israel's salvation. The psalmist had sung the rock of my strength. Isaiah had written, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. What's the difference between Zion with a Z and Sion with an S? Okay, we just heard none. Where is Zion at? Jerusalem. And I'm here to tell you that Jerusalem is Zion or Sion if you want it to be, but the Temple of Pan is at Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is Zion. Did you know that? Did you know that if you Google that, you're going to see a controversy, a Christian controversy that has went on for years and years coming from Matthew 16. Whether Mount Hermon is Zion or Mount Zion in Jerusalem is Zion. The Sabbath school we had in Germany, that was, that was the Sabbath school. It's the first time I've ever heard it discussed. Uh, we put this in place when Paneum opened up in 2017. That's where the German camp meeting was dealing with. It was probably going against, probably going against what I was teaching. But you have to know the distinction. What is Mount Hermon compared to Mount Zion? Okay, who who's Hermon? Who's Hermon? He, he he's a goddess, a god, right? You mean Hermes like? Uh, Hermes. Where, what, what is Hermes? That's that, uh, hermeneutics. hermeneutics. Yeah, hermeneutics. Okay, so was, was that my phone beeping off? Yeah, it was buzzing. It, it, they're done, whoever was doing that. Okay, so anyway. So what are you defining that just in a very quick way? Mount Hermon is Mount Zion I'm, logistically. They both are the same. They're both, called, they're both called that in the scriptures. Zion and Sion is Jerusalem, yeah. but Mount Hermon is also called that. My point is, my point isn't really arguing about the distinction. I'm saying that once again, out of Matthew 16, you have a controversy that is a Christian discussion for hundreds of years. Matthew 16 is a profound chapter in the Bible. Well, they all are, but I'm just pointing one out as we go on. Uh, when we get to our secondary notes, I have some more information on Sion and Zion. Peter himself, writing by inspiration, applies this prophecy to Jesus. He says, If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, unto whom, unto whom coming a living stone, rejected indeed of men, 
but with God elect, precious, ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. Other foundation can no man lay than that it is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, said Jesus, I will build my church in the presence of God and all the heavenly intelligences in the presence of the unseen army of hell. Christ founded his church upon the living rock. The rock is himself, his own body, for us broken and bruised. Against the church built upon this foundation, the gates of hell shall not prevail. How feeble the church appeared when Christ spoke these words. There were only a handful of believers, <coughs> only a handful of believers, against whom all the power of demons and evil men would be directed, yet the follower, followers of Christ were not to fear. Built upon the rock of their strength, they could not be overthrown. For 6,000 years, faith hath built upon Christ. For 6,000 years, the floods and tempests of satanic wrath have beaten upon the rock of our salvation, but it stands unmoved. Peter expressed the truth, which is the foundation of the church faith. And Jesus now honored him as the representative of the whole body of believers. He said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are the words of Christ. Amen. Okay, the keys that are given to the 144,000 is not CNN. It's not signing up for the Jesuit oath. Amen. It's the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. All the words of Holy Scripture are His and are here included. These words have power to open and to shut heaven. They declare the conditions upon which men are received or rejected. Thus the work of those who preach God's word is a savor of life unto life or death unto death. Theirs is a mission weighted with eternal results. <coughs> the Savior did not commit the work of the gospel to Peter individually. At a later time, repeating the words that were spoken to Peter, he applied them directly to the church. And the same in substance was spoken also to the twelve as representatives of the body of believers. If Jesus had delegated any special authority to one of the disciples above the others, we should not find them so often contending as to who should be the greatest. They would have submitted to the wish of their master and honored the one of whom he had chosen. Instead of appointing one to be their head, Christ said to, this, to the disciples, Be ye not called rabbi, neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. She's speaking to Catholicism there, but she's speaking to us here as well. All ye are brethren. Also to the Protestant churches, because they call their ministers reverend. Yeah, and they're the image of the beast at, at, at that level. The head of every man is Christ. I'm going to drop to the next paragraph. On page 6, after Peter's confession, Jesus charged the disciples to tell no man that he was the Christ. This charge was given because of the determined opposition of the scribes and Pharisees. More than this, the people and even the disciples had so false a conception of the Messiah that a public announcement of him would give them no true idea of his character or his work. But day by day he was revealing himself to them as the Savior, and thus he desired to give them the true conception of him as the Messiah. The disciples still expected Christ to reign as a temporal prince. Although he had so long concealed his design, they believed that he would not always remain in poverty and obscurity. The time was near when he would establish his kingdom. That the hatred of the priests and rabbis would never be overcome, that Christ would be rejected by his own nation, condemned as a deceiver, and crucified as a malefactor, such a thought the disciples had never entertained. But the hour of the power of darkness was drawing on, and Jesus must open to his disciples the conflict before them. He was sad as he anticipated the trial. Hitherto he had refrained from making known to them anything relative to his sacrifice and death. In his conversation with Nicodemus, he had said, as Moses was lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the man, Son of Man, be, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But the disciples did not hear this, and had they heard, would not have understood. 
But now they have been with Jesus, listening to his words, beholding his works, until, notwithstanding the humility of his surroundings and the opposition of the priests and the peoples, they can join in the testimony of Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now the time has come for the veil that hides the future to be withdrawn. I'm saying the veil that held the future was withdrawn in 2017. Right after he removed his hand from Rafi and Paneum. I'm saying that we didn't jump on board. We, we saw some things. I mean, I, it, it, it's not, I had 9-11 when I looked up there. We saw some things and put it in the public record right, right off the bat. And I'm encouraged by that. I'm probably the only person on planet Earth that's encouraged by this pandemic. We said that it was going to take place, and it is. And the panic. Okay, but we didn't stick, we didn't stay on, on point and carry it out to its full conclusion. Um, we said more besides pandemic and panic as well. When it was open, we were in the middle of a puddle, and as soon as it was in the next trimester, it's been nonstop hits from yeah. apostasy since that's been open. It's not. Like that's all we've had to deal with was different troubles. Yeah, and troublous people, troublous doctrines. Yeah, I, I get it. I was every, there. Every every trimester since then, and the troubles that have a come new with twist them. from here, a new twist from there, from all across the world. Yeah, kind of off the subject, but uh, you you reminded me of it when I was doing that word study on the word panic the other day. I'm pretty sure that at the Red Sea, when they the, the Israelites were... Wait a second, it. wait a second. She's got a baby she's watching. She wants and to be in two And then the grand cents. finale... The grand finale? ...was Parminder and Tess. And they were here... They were What's here the point? The, so we're talking okay. about all the different yeah, yeah, things yeah, that, that were coming in. I hope that's the in. finale. Let him carry on. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, I, I think it says, and it's a bit of prophecy, that the uh, Israelites were in a panic. But Moses was the only one that said, you know, trust in the Lord, let's go forward. Well, I don't know if the world's in the panic, but that's what's on the headlines all over the place now with yeah. the market. It's in a panic. Um, uh, where did I leave off? Now the time has come for the veil that hides the future to be withdrawn. 2017. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and, ra to, and be raised again the third day. So from that point on, he began to teach us about July 18th. From that point on, he began to teach us about December 25th. Because that, those are the two crosses. Because that history is the history of the doubling. Speechless with grief and amazement, the disciples listened. Christ had accepted Peter's acknowledgement of him as the Son of God, and now his words pointing to his sufferings and death seemed incomprehensible. Peter could not keep silent. He laid hold upon his master as if to draw him back from the, his impending doom, explaining, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter loved his Lord, but Jesus did not commend him for thus manifesting the desire to shield him from suffering. Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. The impression which his words were, would make was directly opposed to that which Christ desired to make on the minds of his followers, and the Savior was moved to utter one of the sternest rebukes that ever fell from his lips. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So what did Peter say? Peter said, it's absolutely out of the context of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's absolutely inconsistent with the love of God that God would allow a nuclear attack on Nashville, Tennessee. 
or a Sunday law. Or a Sunday law. That's what I was thinking. The Sunday law. Or a Sunday law. Because the cross is the Sunday law. No well, Sunday law. They're which, right there at the same time. Which, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. you're speaking to the, 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 the removal of the Sunday law by the P&T movement. Yeah. Well, what you're saying about July 18th, that fits in there too. Okay. Satan was trying to discourage Jesus and turn him from his mission, and Peter, in his blind love, was giving voice to the temptation. The prince of evil was the author of, that, of the thought. His instiga instigation was behind that impulsive appeal. In the wilderness, Satan had offered Christ the dominion of the world on condition of forsaking the path of humiliation and sacrifice. Now he was presenting the same temptation to the disciple of Christ. He was seeking to fix Peter's gaze upon the earthly glory that he might not behold the cross to which Jesus desired to turn his eyes. And through Peter, Satan was again pressing the temptation upon Jesus, but the Savior heeded it not. His thought was for his disciple. Satan had interposed between Peter and his maker that the heart of the disciples might not be touched at the vision of Christ's humiliation for him. The words of Christ were spoken not to Peter, but to the one that, who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get thee behind me, Satan. No longer interpose me and my erring service. servant. Let me come face... Pardon me? No longer interpose between me. No longer interpose between me and my erring servant. Let me come face to face with Peter that I may reveal to him the mystery of love, of my love. Peter's the 144,000. We put that, uh, Larry put that in the record on Sabbath. Okay, his, the numeral, numerical value of his name. His name's already been put in place before this takes place in Matthew 16. So what's that tell you about the 144,000? He's fully settled into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually, and he still, he still gets on the wrong side of an issue. It's an issue of earth. It's earthly glory. It's an earthly issue, like a social yeah. justice issue. A but social it's, justice issue, yeah. It's it a, would sidetrack you to look at the earth versus to look to heaven. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to jump to page eight because I'm just flat out of time. I'm going, to take, I'm going to go to the second paragraph from the bottom. In the region of Caesarea Philippi, Christ was out of the reach of Herod and Caiaphas, the disciples reasoned. He had nothing to fear from the hatred of the Jews or from the power of the Romans. Why not work there a distance from the Pharisees? Why need he give himself up to death? If he was to die, how was it? that his kingdom was to be established so firmly that the gates of hell should not prevail against it. To the disciples, this was indeed a mystery. They were even now journeying along the shores of the Sea of Galilee toward the city where all their hopes were to be crushed. They dared not remonstrate with Christ, but they talked together in low, sorrowful tones in regard to what the future would be. Even amid their questionings, they clung to the thought that some unforeseen circumstance might avert the doom which await, seemed to await their Lord. Thus they sorrowed and doubted, hoped and feared, for six long, gloomy days. Six. I'm on pay, I just finished page eight. Okay. And after the six long, gloomy days, they're at the Mount of Transfiguration, which is chapter 46, which at one level is the Sunday Law, because the temple is complete on October 22, 1844, after 46 years. And on the cross, Christ was lifted up as an ensign. And he's being lifted up as an ensign here in this transfiguration. But save this for tomorrow. By the way, those of you that are watching on live stream, we are going to do a presentation tomorrow morning too. But we have another handout here. Does everyone have the secondary handout? And you can see there the breakdown that Larry put in the record on Sabbath. Uh, Peter's name. Uh, P is the 16th letter. And you've got to think about this. You have to think about this. And I think the, 
when Kathy and I first began studying the Bible, we did so with some really faithful old, at that time, they were older than I am now, they were in their early 80s, Adventists that we providentially moved in next door to, and they asked us if we wanted to study the Bible. We'd never studied the Bible, and so they asked us what we wanted to study, and we said we didn't care, we didn't know the Bible. So they started us through Daniel and Revelation, chapter by chapter, through Daniel, then through Revelation. Faithful old Seventh-day Adventists, nice people. And when he got to the churches in Revelation, he took a great deal of time, and I don't know if you've ever looked at it, but the churches in Revelation, if, if I am in darkness over how I relate to the application of Bible prophecy, one of the primary reasons is because what I learned right at the start about the churches in Revelation, the seven churches. And I'd love to take time here. I'm going to take a little bit of time, but I like to take time to get every detail. When you consider those seven churches, <laughs> Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, they're all on a, a Roman highway, and they're in order. That's the order on the highway, and they're, they're all in Asia Minor. Okay? So on that Roman highway, if you're going to take that highway in that time period, you were going to come to those seven churches in order. And the, the message of those seven churches was consistent with the geography of that city, the history of those cities, the culture of those cities, the names of those cities. Every little detail in Revelation 2 and 3 about those churches that were in those cities has a spiritual application. It just it blows your mind. It means that after the flood when God is bringing the landmass to the surface, that he had to make sure that Asia Minor was created in that way so that hundreds of years later, when the Romans built this highway, that they would go in that direction. And he had, had, like, he had to make sure that this city was on a mountain because that was going to be part of the story and that this city had been hit by earthquake after earthquake because that was part of the story, that Laodicea had underground water springs of lukewarm water. He had to control everything about Asia Minor for thousands of years, including the selection of their names. And so my point is, is when that, when that brother took us through that and I seen that it was valid, I realized that Christ has control of every little, de every little detail there is. And it's from that point of reference that I don't have a problem seeing the details such as Peter's name value, okay? Christ is in control of all those things. And if you, do, if you haven't settled in, I mean, that, among other things, Daniel 2 and 3, or Revelation 2 and 3 with the seven churches, if you settle into the, there isn't one word in there that isn't profound on how God controlled the, the history, the culture, the geography to put him in place. Okay, it just blows your mind. Go study it if you haven't ever done it. Very quickly, uh, Acts 17, uh, verse 26, and also Deuteronomy 30, 10 to 4. Is, it, I'm sorry, not 10 to 4. Anyway, Acts, one anyway. at a time. Acts 17, 26. 26. You can read it. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And Deuteronomy well, 32, no, 8. Sorry. It's, 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 never mind, but there's one other scripture I can't, I don't, I'm not, my eyes aren't falling on it right now, but anyway, there's, I think it's in Deuteronomy 32 actually. Yeah, 32, 8, I think. I thought that's where you were going. They both express that thought, that God is in control of those When the things. Most High divided the nations, yeah. their inheritance, when He separated the sons of Adam, He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. It, anyway, He's in control of it all. Okay, so on these notes, I want to just take maybe 10 minutes, unless I wax eloquent as I do, or wax, I don't know if it's eloquent, as I do sometimes. <laughs> now, 
I'm going to read this. This is just stuff that I casually this morning pulled off the Internet, but I know that it's valid because I've looked it up in detail before. Caesarea Philippi, which stood in the lush area near the foot of what? Mount Hermon. Okay, so Paneum is at the base of Mount Hermon, was a city dominated by immoral activities and pagan worship. Caesarea Philippi stood only 25 miles from the religious communities of Galilee. Galilee means a turning point, a hinge. But, this, but the city's religious practices were vastly different from those of nearby Jewish towns. In Old Testament times, the northeastern area of Israel became the center for Baal worship. In the nearby city of Dan, Israelite King Jeroboam built the high places. So Pan is right by Dan, which takes us to 1 Kings 13, which takes us to the midnight cry. Built the high place that angered God and eventually led the Israelites to worship false gods. Eventually, worship of the Baals was replaced with worship of Greek fertility gods. Caesarea Philippi, which stood in a lush area near the foot of Mount Hermon, became the religious, I must have repeated that. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, I did. Became the religious center for the worship of the Greek god Pan. The Greeks named the city Panis in his honor. Okay. Banis, Panis, Pan, Caesarea Philippi. And it's after the Greek God, okay? Interestingly, Jesus chose to deliver a sort of graduation speech to his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. In that pagan setting, he encouraged his disciples to build a church that would overcome the worst evils. To the pagan mind, the cave at Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld. You can see that cave. Just get, go on the internet and you'll find videos of people visiting that cave. It in ancient times, the, the pool was in the cave and they built a temple in front of the cave. Okay? Now the pool is outside the cave because the temple has been torn down and there's, there's probably been some geographical changes. But the whole story is there. On the, you can read it off the, the signs there. Um, anything we're telling you is just flat out. That's just the way it is. To the pagan mind, the cave at Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld where fertility, fertility gods lived during the winter. They committed detestable acts to worship these false gods. They did human sacrifice. And it, they'd throw the bodies in the pool. If the body sank, then the Lord accepted the offering. But if blood came up in the springs outside, then God was offended by the offering. I mean, they know that much detail of these, these ancient rites at the Temple of Pan. Caesarea Philippi's location was especially unique because it stood at the base of the cliff where spring water flowed. At what, one time, the water ran directly from the mouth of the cave set in the bottom of the cliff. The pagans of Jesus' day commonly believed that the fertility gods lived in the underworld during the winter and returned to the earth each spring. They saw water as a symbol of the underworld and thought that their gods traveled to and from the world through caves. To the pagan mind, then, the cave and spring water at Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld. They believed that their city was literally the gates of the underworld, the gates of hell. In order to entice the return of their god Pan each year, the people of Caesarea Philippi engaged in horrible deeds, including prostitution and sexual interaction between humans and goats. Okay, Pan is a goat god. Goat is a sacrificial animal. Okay. When Jesus brought his disciples to the area, they must have been shocked. Caesarea Philippi was like a red light district in their world, and devout Jews would have avoided any contact with the despicable acts committed there. It was a city of people knocking on the doors of hell. Okay, so that's where he took them. Um, and I could jump to the end to, to go to Mount Hermon because it's at the base of Mount Hermon, but I won't. I'm going to switch now to try to give you my argument about why this is the second witness for, for Daniel 8.13 in Palmoni. Philippi, the town was named after Caesar, but it was built by one of Caesar's workers, a, a, 
a, a, a lesser than Caesar. What would you call it? If Caesar's the king, Herod Philippi built it, and Herod Philippi was a general, okay, and Caesar was the king. So he named it after Caesar because he wanted to suck up to Caesar, Caesarea, but he was also full of himself, so he included his name, Philippi. That's why those two names are there. Okay, Caesarea Philippi. But Philippi, the first three letters of Philippi is the mathematical term phi, P-H-I. Phi is the, what, what letter of the Greek alphabet? It's the midnight letter of the Greek alphabet. Okay, the 21st letter of the Greek alphabet. And in mathematics is used as a symbol for the golden ratio. Okay, the golden ratio refers to a special number that is approximately equal to 1.618. Okay, the, the golden, the number, the special number that refers to the golden ratio which is called phi, that mathematical number is 1.618. And I'm saying that in Matthew 16, 18. 16, 18 is phi. You see it? And what does... 1618 tell us and I said unto thee thou art Peter and upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it okay here's Palmoni wanting us to see that in Caesarea Philippi that the first three letters of Philippi is phi which is the golden number of the golden ratio and the very verse is speaking to that ratio and it's saying that I will build my church. Okay. When did he finish his church in Millerite history? October 22nd, 1844. And on October 22nd, 1844, what came together to build his church? Pardon me? The sanctuary and the host. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? The 2300 and the 2520 come together on October 22nd, 1844 to build his church. That's Daniel 813. But upon Matthew 16, 18, which is five, this is where he's going to build his church, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you see the connection? This is Palmoni. Amen. You see it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the 2300 and the 2520 come together on October 22nd, 1844, and it restores, it restores the sanctuary and the host. And the sanctuary and the host are his church. They're restored. And here in Matthew 16, 18, he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In that verse, you have phi. The number of phi is one Point six one eight, and this is Matthew sixteen eighteen, which is the same number. But in that verse, where he's going to build his church, you have the hundred and forty-four thousand represented in Peter. Through now, I, now I'm, I started here once earlier in this presentation, and I f I got sidetracked. I f don't know how. I don't care. But I want you to understand. It was when I went to the churches. You got to understand this. You have to understand this. Who wrote Matthew? Matthew. Matthew. What, what nationality was Matthew? He was a Jew. So if he wrote Matthew, what, did he, what language did he write it in? Spanish? Hebrew. 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 Okay. And in order to get into these, the manuscripts of the New Testament, it's going to end up in what? Greek. 
Okay, it's going to go from Hebrew to Greek. But God's going to choose a specific Bible for God's people at the end of the world, which is the King James Bible. Right? So Matthew has went from Hebrew to Greek to English. All right, so you, you, in order to solve Peter's name and see the 144,000, you're seeing a P as the, the 16th letter, not in the Hebrew, not the 16th letter in the Greek, but the 16th letter in the English. Okay, God had to control Peter's name through Hebrew to Greek to English and make sure that the number of letters in the English alphabet corresponded to the letters we have today. By the way, when they wrote the King James Bible, was it the same amount of letters in the English uh, alphabet as, our, as exists today? No. They've changed. They've lost, some, they've lost some vowels. So he controlled all of that. He controlled every bit of it to make sure that we would see that Peter as a name is also a number and he did it in a verse in Caesarea Philippi and the first three letters of Philippi is phi and phi is the mathematical symbol of 1.618 and in the verse he says this is where I build my church and he built his church on October 22nd, 1844, when he brought the sanctuary and the host together based upon Daniel 8.13, where he introduces himself as Palmoni. And I'm saying Matthew is the second witness to Palmoni. Do you see it? Okay, <laughs> there's more to it. We'll get to the more to it. The golden ratio refers to a special number that is approximately one point. 618 is also known as the golden section, golden mean, divine section, medial proportion, golden cut, extreme and mean ratio, golden number, or divine proportion. The golden ratio is, beyond, is obtained when a line is divided into two parts such that, are, such that the longer part divided by the smaller part is, in, is equal to the entire length of the line divided by the longer part. I can't explain that to you. You read it enough, maybe you can explain it to yourself. For example, two portions made during 6 61.8 and 38.2 on a straight line form a golden ratio. It appears frequently in architecture, art, and geometry. But there are some things I want to tell you about this, even though I can't explain it all. Next paragraph. Some 20th century architects and artists have proportioned their works to approximate the golden cut because they believe it is aesthetically pleasing. It is widely believed, although not proven, that the Parthenon Temple in Greece was built with the golden ratio in mind. The Parthenon Temple, have we ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Was it ever duplicated in the United States? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where at? Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. The golden number is also used to analyze the proportion of natural objects as well as the man-made systems like financial markets. The golden ratio is an irrational number, which is a real number that cannot be represented in a simple fashion. The digits continue with no noticeable pattern. Fibonacci's golden ratio. The relationship of Fibonacci's sequence to the golden ratio is this. Now this is another mathematical phenomenon besides the golden ratio called Fibonacci, Fibonacci's sequence. But they're connected, and you've got to see this. He, Fibonacci's sequence, it's there, and it impacts virtually all of creation. It works this way. You start with zero, go to the next number, and you take those first two numbers and you add them. And zero plus one is... Okay, you do it again. One plus one is what? Two. One plus two is what? Three. three plus two is what? Five. Five plus three is? Eight. Five plus eight is? Thirteen. And it goes on. But Daniel 8, 13 is emphasizing Fibonacci's sequence. Okay, it, 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 it's, it's there if you're willing to see it. 
Um, yeah, and then 8 and 13, yeah, it goes on indefinitely. And when you, when you begin to look at the places this occurs in creation, and the golden ratio occurs in creation, you'll see that Palmoni is the author of mathematics at any level of mathematics. He's also the author of language. And he, he's let us see that people's names, like Peter, have mathematical values. Okay, let me read a couple more things. I won't, I won't do page three on Zion and Zion, but I want to finish this last part. I mean, he, um, he's the author of universal languages because the universal language is math and music. You know, those, those are languages that doesn't matter what you speak, they're the same. This, this sequence would be the same in any world. Something interesting about it. What I want you to see is that this sequence of Fibonacci is connected with Phi. And Phi is Matthew 16, 18. And his sequence has in it Daniel 8, 13. I want you to see the second witness at more than one level. But under Pan, on page 2, in ancient Greek religion and mythology, Pan is the god of the wild, shepherds and flocks, natures of mountain wilds, rustic music and impromptus, and companions of nymphs. He has hindquarters, legs, and horns of a goat, in the same manner as a fawn or satyr. With his homeland in rustic Arcadia, he is also recognized as the god of fields, groves, woods, glens, and often affiliated with sex. Because of this, Pan is connected to fertility and the season of spring. The ancient Greeks also considered Pan to be the god of theatrical criticism. The word panic ultimately derives from the god's name. The son of Hermes. Hermes is Mount Hermon, where the temple of Pan is. And Hermes, this god that it's going to tell you about, how does, how does that relate to Catholic, apostate, Protestant application? It's hermeneutics. Comes from Hermes, Mount Hermon. The son of Hermes and Penelope, or Zeus and Hybris, Pan was the Greek god of shepherds and flocks, who was especially popular in Arcadia. He was depicted as a satyr with a reed pipe, a shepherd's crook. He's a shepherd. He's a counterfeit shepherd. He's a musician. He's a sacrificial animal. He's a goat. And a branch of pine or crown of pine needles. In Greek mythology, the satyrs and deities of the woods and mountains. Pan is also known as the goat of Mendes. And can be found today in the form of the horned goat god. Made famous by the Knights Templar, Baphomet, 33 degree Freemasons, Albert Pike had written about in Morals and Dogmas. You can show from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy that the religion of the United Nations is the religion of Freemasonry. <laughs> uses the very expression Freemasonry. Okay? So this is, this is the, the god of Freemasonry, Pan. And if we're going to... Sister White says the god of the United Nations. She doesn't say it with these words, but she teaches that the globalist god is spiritualism, but what would we call their religion of the United Nations today in our modern terminology? New Age. This is the New Age religion, okay? And the god of the New Age religion is Pan. He's the goat god. He's the, the music god. He's the, the theatrical god. He's the sex god. He was the patron god of Arcadia, Perhaps because of his association with nature and animals, Pan did not have the appearance of a normal man. Now I want you to get this next part, because what I'm saying is this is the great controversy. This is the counterfeit. Okay? It's, at, it's at Mount Hermon, which is Zion, in the scriptures. Mount Hermon is Zion. And Mount Hermon is miles away from Jerusalem, but the scripture says Jerusalem is Zion. So you've got to wrap your mind about, about that, that there's two Zions. But this is the controversy between Christ and Satan. 
But the Zion that is Mount Hermon is where the temple of Pan is. And Pan is the shepherd god, the counterfeit to the true shepherd. He is the, all these things that we've said, but notice this next part. The bottom half of his body was like a goat, and the top, of it, top half of his body being like other men. You've seen that, that. Okay. So what was he? He's a combination of divinity and humanity counterfeited. Half man, half animal. He's a god. He's the god Pan. So half of him is God and the other half is creation. Okay, this is, this is the, the great controversy played out at Caesarea Philippi with Pan. And what is the classic story? Peter. It's about Peter and Pan that are in controversy in Caesarea Philippi. Peter Pan. And what is, well, anyway, we won't get into the real story of Peter Pan, but it is a real story about Satan being kicked out of heaven. Go read the real story of Peter Pan. Don't do it. It's a satanic book, but it's about Lucifer being kicked out of heaven and trying to prevent all the children from being saved. Okay. So, what I'm saying is that Paneum is the cross. The Lord opened up the foreshadow of the cross in 2017 at Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, but he was pointing forward to the cross, the Sunday law, and that when we get to Paneum, there is things that will happen that are connected with Pan. And you notice in here, they, they had the wisdom, and these are just, I don't know who these are, these aren't Adventists, to see that the Greeks understood that the word panic come from Pan. <coughs> But we took it a step further. We've seen that pandemonium is going to take place when Pandora's box is opened. And that those that leave this movement are going to go into spiritualism. can give you hundreds of witnesses to that in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. And the spiritualism that they go into is the Omega Apostasy that was typified by the Alpha Apostasy, and the religion of the Alpha Apostasy was what was called pantheism. Pantheism. And pantheism has a temple that is marked in Daniel chapter 8. And it's called the Pantheon Temple, the Temple of the Gods. Pantheon Temple. So, this whole story, the, by taking the word pan, we have biblical justification for reading into it these, these variations on the word pan. Why? Because the God that we serve has demonstrated that he has control of numbers, of words, of human history. And he's given us evidence now that we've reached panium in the story of the Constitution of the United States. At the end of February, February, Panium arrived, and we're in the panic and the pandemic that is pointing forward to the Panium of July 18th, when it's only going to get worse. So, the Lord has opened up since 2017, the foreshadowing of the, the cross, if we will but see it. On the previous notes on page 5, again, the statement, second paragraph. Page 5, previous notes, second paragraph. Jumping in the middle of the paragraph, in the presence of God and all the heavenly intelligences, in the presence of the unseen army of hell, Christ founded his church upon the living rock. Before, I had thought about that in a very general sense in which, okay, the devil's there, you know. But the fact that, the, that that temple was there, you can look at this in a very literal sense. Yeah, that is, if you go into the history of Greek mythology, the history of the New Age, they refer to the Temple of Pan in Caesarea Philippi. It's, it's not something that only Christians have derived. And don't miss the fact that we read here, what town is close to there? What territory of the 12 tribes is it in? It's in the territory of Dan. 
And what's Dan mean to us? Jeroboam set up the two counterfeit altars, one in Bethel, one in Dan. Okay, it's right there, the, the rebellion. I just realized uh, a memory I have of that, this is kind of off the subject, but it's related. There in the, the chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets, either the one, that one or the one just previous to it, where uh, it's called Apostles Together Jordan, she's dealing with uh, Numbers 25. In some way or fashion, she, Ellen White, brings out the fact that they were in an area that was grossly heathen. I'll, I'll just generalize it. As they were here. As they were here. So you can connect Numbers 25 with this. Right, so. I was going to say, speaking about all those pan pandemonium, pan, and I was watching, well, I was looking yesterday at the so-called visible sign of the other movement, and it just happens to be pants. pants. Yeah. But then I just looked up where the word pants comes from, and just look, look at this real fast, just one sentence. The word comes from the name of stock figures in a comedy, uh, dell'art, a form of Italian comic theater popular throughout Europe from the 16th from the from the 16th to the mid 18th century, which is five, 16, 16 18. 18. Yeah. And pan is associated with theater. And pants came out of that history. Yeah. Pantomime. Before the talkies. So did, did, did you get the numerical connection with Matthew 16, 18 and Daniel 8, 13. That second witness. So it means that Matthew 16 is part of the message of the midnight cry because it's connected to Paneum, but it's also connected with Palmoni, the wonderful number. It's connected with the 2520. It is the great controversy. It is the worship of Jeroboam, the worship of Egypt that takes place in the Omega Movement. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to see these wonderful things out of your word, but by seeing them, we recognize that we are approaching the cross, that we're in the foreshadowing of the cross, that time is short, and that the troubles of this earth are only going to increase and escalate as we move forward. We ask that through the power of your word, you would strengthen us to stay on this path and keep moving forward in such a way that we can accomplish salvation for ourselves and bring salvation, be instruments that you can bring salvation to others and that we can glorify you as we continue to walk forward. We thank you for these things. Ask a blessing upon the production of sending this out over the internet. In Jesus' name, amen.